Here's my baby. I'm Dana Denha. And I'm Melissa Bondi. And this is Adventures in Parenthood. Throughout this series, we will explore the world of raising kids from newborn through adulthood. Having a baby or kids around the house can change the dy dynamic of the household in ways you never even fathomed, especially when there are animals involved. Many times before bringing home a real live baby, your firstborn is your fur baby, and it is imperative to make them feel comfortable when there are big changes on the horizon. So when you brought Bryn home, you actually had two dogs at the time. You currently only have one. Yeah. Uh, did you do anything to prepare the dogs for the arrival of the baby? Uh, we did the, you know, put the ba put the dogs near the belly type. Well, oh, when you were pregnant. Yeah, when yeah. we were pregnant, right, correct. Um, I don't think it did anything. No, before, yeah. like before coming home to the hospital, you didn't. I actually remember, uh, <laughs> really? it was before I came home with the baby. Uh, but we were in the hospital and Keaton had, you know, that first baby cap that they wear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my husband, Rob, came and took the cap from her after and brought it home to the cat so he could smell oh, it to kind okay. of be like, here, here's a new smell that's coming into okay. the house. Sure, sure. But other than that, yeah, I don't really remember other than like after, as time went on, like being like, oh, here, pet him, he's soft. And just like when she was really little, just to kind of show her that there was another family member in the Did house. Did the cat know, like, Probably went up and smelled her when she was a baby and was like, what Yeah, is he this definitely, thing? Yeah, yeah, he sniffed around her a little bit and he uh, actually loved it. What are those things called? The little uh, play mats that have the things hanging over them. So that, like, when, oh. when we started putting her under there, yeah. he kind of took that as his own and okay. he would okay. lay under there all sure, the time. Sure, like so. a toy, yeah, hanging toys. Yeah. yeah, so okay. I think he was like, Well, you know, she gets a lot of stuff, so I'm going to get some stuff too. Okay. Uh, but I definitely felt like he was a little mad at me for a while after I think there was a you know because he was my baby for a sure. really long time and it was like every time I came home from work we hugged and and it was yeah. like I couldn't even really lift him because I had a c-section so right there was like this change in dynamic and yep. I had to take care of this thing that was loud and, and demanding that's too funny no that's <laughs> so real that's the yeah. thing that's it's yeah. not a myth that's real I know it is yeah <laughs> the dogs will they get jealous I think um we had the Pom, Pomeranians. I don't think they felt like that. Um, I think they were just like, oh, okay, something else is here now. So I wonder if there's a difference, too, because, you know, <laughs> Paxton was an only cat. Maybe. And you had two dogs and Maybe. they had each other. Right. That could have been, too. Yeah. Yeah, no, but there wasn't any type of jealousy, and it was simply that if she was on the bed, I'm talking infant, you know, on the bed, and they would be on the bed, and we didn't really worry about having to, I think, Step on her. They, but they're small dogs. So yeah, yeah, bigger yeah. dogs, you would have to worry about that. But they really didn't. They didn't step on her. They didn't get in her way. I mean, so there was never any type of worries like that that I think some parents may have when bringing home a, mm -hmm. you know, a baby. Yeah, and there was no growling or any sort of sign no, of negativity from no, them. Yeah. We're pretty tame dogs and well, well behaved dogs. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, I think it's a breed thing. You know, bigger dogs are going to be like, oh, what is this? And be more aggressive, possibly. And maybe even a cat. I mean, and then cats have claws. So. Yeah, I don't, I've never seen him be aggressive. I've seen him get mad at her where he's like more, his is uh, fleeing the situation oh, rather right, than right. like fighting the situation. <laughs> uh, I think the big thing was more when she got mobile. Oh, yeah, of And course. he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now you're like pulling my tail and now you're screaming really loud and it hurts my right. ears. So it's like us teaching her that like you yeah. have to be gentle and to not be super loud when you're right in front of his face. Right. Don't. No screaming, no yelling, because again, it's an animal. You, you can't predict what they're going to do. You hope that you've trained them properly. Yeah, but yeah. I think um, the loudness is an issue too. Yeah, keeping yeah. Well, you down, tone it down. They have sensitive ears, <laughs> yeah. so. And sometimes she'll get in his face, like right in his face, and want to be in his face. I'm like, be nice, be nice, like be nice. And, and even petting, I'm like, oh. Pet nicely, gently. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, that's a toddler for you. Yeah, so. but I think, like, as we're going to talk about today, it's a learning experience for both the kids and the animals. They have to learn how to interact with each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so um, whether you have a dog or a cat at home, um, your kids will meet dogs possibly at friends, at families, neighbors, and you want them to know the proper way to interact with their four-legged friends. 
And joining us is Kathy Ricefield with Dependable Dogs. And she's here today to tell us how to better read the language of our furry friends. Welcome, Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So yeah, like Dana said, you seem to be a wealth of knowledge when it comes to introducing little ones and dogs to families and kind of merging the two. But it's not even necessarily just little ones, right? It's just people in general. Yeah. You know, we, for the sake of humans and dogs, it would be great if we were all smarter about dog body language and behavior um, to keep dogs in homes for the remainder of their days, but also to keep kids and adults safe in homes with those dogs so that we're not applying pressures or stressing them that they may feel a need to use their teeth or mm -hmm. behave inappropriately. Um, so working with everyone from expecting parents to help prepare the dog for the arrival of um, the baby. And then you touched on uh, several things in your introduction which are critical. As soon as these kids can move into and reach into the dog's space, three to five months they've got this. Mm -hmm. They're up and they're crawling and then they're pulling to stand mm -hmm. and walking and running. And dogs, it's my husband's analogy was it's like a new video game. You master one level and then the screen changes and it moves faster. Mm. The dog's often left without any frame of reference. Mm. It's very confusing for a lot of dogs. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and you're saying, it, I mean, they could be confusing. You're saying for any age, like even a, not a puppy, but I'm just saying, a, you know, you've seen your dogs maybe act a little differently than, you know, a middle aged dog. And, and I come to this um, having been a clinician first, and I'm a mom, and I'm a grandmother, and I we have to. And the tagline for my business is training for success at both ends of the leash. Okay. Leash. So we have to look at the developmental level of the child, what they're able to do, okay. and then also where the dog is in terms of their development. Are they a puppy? Are they a teenager? Are they? A senior and dogs are considered seniors roughly when they're about six and older yeah. mm -hmm. and um, one of the programs that I represent I love the line is that our children grow up in our dogs age so we have to prepare on both sides to adjust for every stage okay well you mentioned your business it's dependable dogs can you explain what your business is my business is based in Ann Arbor um, I form incorporated the business um, about 11 years ago, prior to moving to Michigan, moving to Michigan, you have to be incorporated in Michigan, so mm -hmm. now we are officially a Michigan corporation. Mm -hmm. um, and I have been doing dog bite prevention education through Dependable Dogs since founding it, um, focusing primarily on dog bite prevention and dog safety since being here. And then in February of this year, formed a nonprofit Kids and Dogs Safer Together to help fund different materials for programs that we're doing in the community like we had been doing Safety Town. We're doing a program with um, two pediatric fellows at Mott Children's and Children's in Detroit to work with Head Start programs to basically pay for the materials that we're handing out to families there. Mm -hmm. So dependable dogs, um, Primarily individual training, education, small group classes, and then okay. community education work. Okay. So are you, so someone could call you up and like I could call you if I'm, I'm going to have a baby soon and I'm not, I'm just saying. But if I, you I'm were, yes. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I've got a dog, help me, help me, help me. Is that something? Yes. Um, a, uh, every client who my, contacts me you know, my family's gets gonna an, change and no absolutely gets an intake form and when I work individually initial sessions are two to two and a half hours okay. and we go through everything how old is your dog where do they sleep where do they eat okay. when okay. what do we have do you have a known bite bite history how well do you know your dog what worries them now um, until the closing of the Babies or Us stores mm -hmm. I was in Babies or Us around this area six to eight times a year doing one hour free oh, okay. introduction sessions okay. just because if you can't afford to hire a trainer sure. you don't know what else is out there we could give people a, a real good top line of what to think about if, as they were preparing to bring a child into their home mm -hmm. with their dogs um, I'll be doing one of those actually at Macomb 
animal shelter at the end of October, an intro to dogs and storks, and then a two and a half hour dogs and toddlers class. So, where else do you speak? That's that's me. I didn't know that. So what are, like what other? Oh, it sometimes like, it feels like <laughs> just everywhere. <laughs> well, I've had like, clients in Okemos and outside of Toledo. Okay. Oh, I so you're some, traveling. You tra yeah. Well, yeah. it. There are three of us in Michigan who are Family Paws parent educators at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and I network with other trusted trainers, not just here but elsewhere, so that maybe if those trainers aren't as familiar with dog baby dog child dynamics, we can go in as a consultant and help them. Um, I just did a class in Ferndale a couple of weeks ago okay. with a training group that I just love and what we do a fair amount of work together with clients that we refer back and forth. Well, I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the term trusted trainers yeah. because the big thing we were talking about when we were chatting on the phone was that there's actually a lot of um, information that isn't factual out there right. because there's not a real regulation on training dogs. No, there is. And as an industry, dog training is relatively new compared mm -hmm. to, I mean, I come out of being a clinician where you have an established educational program, approved curriculum, you are licensed, you're tested, you're mm -hmm. retested to be trusted to do what you do. With dog training, um, people in the 80s had started with a lot of videos and the occasional book. And then fast forwarding into the 90s, there were some industry groups that formed, some of them for education. Uh, New Jersey is considering a licensure law right now, which I'm not quite sure where that is. But mm -hmm. to work as a dog trainer, unfortunately, um, there is no minimum requirement for education. There, mm -hmm. are, there are groups that are doing education that I look at them, and if you have trust, graduated as a trainer from one of a very short list of programs, I pretty much trust that you know what you know. Mm -hmm and that you're training in a certain way using humane methods, and that I'm more comfortable referring to people. The good news is that we're all getting better with this, but you know, the first exam for board certified credentialed veterinarians in behavior wasn't offered until the mid 90s, and they had six people who took the exam, and they're are a greater number of credentialed veterinary behaviorists who are board certified mm -hmm. veterinarians um, who are trained specifically in behavior. But dog training is pretty much yeah. kind of a wild, wild west. It sounds like mm -hmm. it. Yes. So who did you bring with you today? Who did I bring with you? <laughs> I have um, approximately 20 of these dogs that I take into different sessions. I, you know, this one doesn't really have a name. Oh, um, <laughs> they all, <laughs> the kids will sometimes read the tan, tags and go, they're all named dependable dogs. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. but they, okay. that way I know they belong to me. Um, I use a lot of prop dogs sure. when I'm working with kids, kids who are afraid of dogs. In a group situation, if I'm bringing a real dog in, they're often so worried about the real dog that they yeah. can't hear me. Yeah. Or they're okay. magnetized to dogs and why would you listen to this lady yeah. talking because there's a dog here. Mm -hmm. But he, he's, um, we don't put masking tapes on our, our real dogs, but he's also um, wearing masking tape because he's been used to practice with safe petting oh, okay. with some toddlers and preschoolers. Mm -hmm. okay. So are those markings then, show us what the, what the tape is then. Those the are tape safe. is, we talk about petting one hand. We do a lot of rhyming, mm -hmm. sit on the ground, not the hound one hand enough, two hands too rough. So oh, okay. practicing with petting one hand collar to tail. And a lot of people come in to talk, pet dogs straight over their head. Mm -hmm. And if you ever watch a dog as you're doing that, they're kind of blinking like, and mm -hmm. hunching. Cowering, so, cowering. They, yeah. so talking about safe touches coming in from the periphery, touching chest or shoulder, uh, pat, pat, paws, step away. If the dog wants more attention, okay. they'll let you know. Okay. So um, I use a lot of props, singing, pictures, okay. to get as much of the information to stick as possible. Mm -hmm. okay. But yes, I have a collection of dogs with masking too. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, that, that's a great, uh, the, what you said right there about 
the head versus the, mm -hmm. like, my daughter does it all the time, but she goes right for yeah. the head, and he's, you could tell he doesn't like it, but kids want, the, they, I think you've, they've also been learned, pet him in the head, give him a little pet. Like, everybody does it. Literally you know, everybody like, pets a but dog But they don't the like head. it necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> well, and there's also the, a group of trainers talking about the fact that we're, we're told, take your hand, put it in the dog's face, as oh, opposed, you know, it. and really they can smell you just fine from where they are. Oh, so don't, okay. So, what we're trying to change up the dynamic is to invite the dog over. Invites to create the frights and bites. So if we're inviting the dog over to interact and the dog says, oh, okay, I'd like to meet you, okay. mm -hmm. providing they're not knocking over your two to four-year-old. Um, or they're looking at you and going, you know, we're fine here. We'll okay. just stay away. To teach your child to respect what the dog is choosing to do. Sure. Um, do you find that, real quick, do you find that, um, what's the age for that? Like a good starting, do you find that they're they most receptive, kids are? Is it? I think we can start really young. You were talking about petting and we're saying gentle. Remind me how old your little one two is. Two and a half. Yeah. Two and a half year olds. I mean, the, the name of the game developmentally is they're impulsive. They're moving in erratic ways. And we also can't <laughs> depend on them to remember things. So we encourage a lot of hand over hand content. Okay. So it's soft touch, not too much. Um, and if younger children are grabbing and we're doing hand over hand and they grab the dog, we can get everybody out of that. Um, okay. and, and so doing as much supervising as guiding of the interaction as we can as opposed to waiting until, oh boy, that's too close, you know, oh. and who are we moving first, the child or the dog? Okay. All right, we're going to leave off right there, sure. and we're going to come back with more about the supervision aspect, because that's a big part of making your dog and your baby feel comfortable together. Absolutely. So we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with more from Kathy. <laughs> We're back with Kathy Ricefield with Dependable Dogs. So before we took the break, we were talking about dog supervision. You actually like sent me a little flyer thing that was like, don't be absent and let the dog. So what are like the different kinds of supervision and how should we be there? Family Paws identified five types of supervision, basically ranging from absent, which is just, you're not there, you're not, if you're not there, you're not aware, you have no idea what's going on, mm -hmm. to being proactive, full awake adult supervision. You have to leave the room to use the restroom, get a cup of coffee, get a glass of water, get a bottle. Where's the dog? Where's the child? Um, using crates, gates, um, just making sure that you know where everyone is with no unsupervised access to one another. Because mm -hmm. particularly mm. with toddlers, boy, you know, they may be leaving the dog alone when you're there, but you walk out of the room and then what happens? Mm -hmm. They play dress up with them. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, you just put my underwear on the dog's head. And I was out of the room. <laughs> Does that really happen? Oh, it happens often. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah, that was one of those all OMG moments. But one of the things we talked about earlier was dog body language. Yes. And I think that a lot of people probably read dog body language wrong. Definitely. The smarter we are, the better we can do. When we know better, we do better. And so um, a one of the things that we're giving out, I give to my private clients, but as part of the grant that we're giving out for Head Start, is a whole card game 
with dog body language, which is really appropriate for about three and up. Mm -hmm. um, friend of mine who worked with Detroit Animal Control mm -hmm. for a long time took a look at these, and I guess her significant other said, oh, that's what you meant by airplane ears. Um, we tell parents to look at eyes, ears, tail, muzzle, gather the clues, solve the pro puzzle. Does the dog look like they're soft and relaxed, or do they look like they're worried? And then we're matching that information up according to what the child can process, because kids can't really read body language until they're about seven, mm -hmm. particularly with stress and fear signals. Okay. So it, it's just this, like everything else, ongoing education. And if we're smarter as parents, we can be more proactive. Sure, absolutely. Is there any, what a, could you just give us a quick, like a couple misnomers as far as, I loved what you talked about, petting the dog, petting a dog. Um, but what about big dogs versus little dogs and treating them? How, how would you treat them? It's really much different. It's about the individual dog. It's less okay. about breed and size, but some dogs are more resilient and forgiving. How old is the dog? Okay. Um, you know, aid, dogs are masters of masking pain as they age. Their vision may be changing, their hearing, right. and you know, these really little kids are often coming in hot and fast and hugging dogs. Mm -hmm. And wagging tails are often misinterpreted. You know, there may be a right. bite and the response is, but they were wagging his tail. It's like, mm -hmm. well, where was the tail? How fast was it wagging? Was it low and slow? Was it high and up like a flag? Um, so looking at the entire dog and making a decision, are they comfortable or should I stay away? Well, the one thing I was kind of thinking about too is when you have young children, there's always food around. So I'm sure that has to be a big thing. I, I've dealt with both where like I, I, I will feed a dog the table scraps, I'll admit it. Mm -hmm. um, but like some dogs can gently take something out of your hand and other dogs will just so I think that also has to be a big thing with kids because kids want to share with dogs and dogs yeah. know kids have food. Oh, totally. <laughs> and then there's this cause and effect that you drop food from the high chair, dogs appear. How wonderful <laughs> is that? I mean, and it came uh, out. <laughs> so working, if you know that your dog does not take treats softly, work on dropping treats. Often with little kids, even if the dog is very gentle, soft mouth, dog's mouth comes in and the child's hands go like this. Mm -hmm. So we'll do treat delivery at the end of a wooden spoon or a spatula with peanut butter, squeezed cheese, hand over hand, so that the dog isn't being smacked in the head by the mechanism mm -hmm. to create that much more space. Um, and it depends on knowing your dog. Is your dog mm -hmm. very impulsive? Their level of arousal is pretty low when it comes to food. Um, there's a meme from Family Paws that says your child's walking around with a cracker and you think, isn't that adorable? And the dog's thinking it's a really interesting food dispenser. How do I get some of that? <laughs> so right. what do you want the dog to do? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Is there, what, give us a um, tip on, uh, uh, that was great, that was a great analogy you just said about the like peanut butter, something yeah. at the end of a spoon or, yeah. but what about like um, treats, like bones or some type of heart, or even the soft food, um, as far as... In, in terms of using them for training, or just for giving, just... Like, little kids giving them, um, is it... Yeah, because you're like, oh, you want to get used to the dog? Here, give the dog some treats. You want to give him, you <laughs> give him his... You know, depending upon the dog, and I don't always, and depending on the child, you don't want that quick interaction, so we'll often talk about carrying your baby in arms and your dog is eating, mm. and you're walking by just dropping pieces of cheese in their bowl. Mm -hmm. But your approach, walking feet with the baby under control, predicts good things coming to the dog. Okay. Um, sometimes, even behind a gate, with the age of child that you have, is if I just squeeze things through the hole in this gate, the dog will come. And some dogs are fine with that, sitting quietly, the other dogs are tearing down the gate right. to get over I to, I, you know, I know where you keep them, I can get more. Um, <laughs> so it, right. it, I hate to sound, the dog trainer's response is often, it depends, okay. mm -hmm. but it's going to depend on your child, how old they are, and the dog in your house. Okay. One thing I didn't know that you mentioned uh, earlier to me was that dogs have to learn how to walk with a stroller. 
Many of them, yes. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> well, some dogs don't necessarily have great leash manners to mm. start, and then you add this bulky item that you're pushing, and the dog can either be very worried about it, or if every time you've ever stopped on a walk, the dog spins around and sits right in front of you, you're not going to get very far very yeah. fast. Mm -hmm. So we suggest that people practice. Yeah. Um, if you know that your dog is a lunger, squirrels, kids on skateboards, right. kid on a bicycle, decide whether you should be walking your dog while strollering or baby wearing. Um, different what do you need what does the dog need mm -hmm. and that will change as everybody grows up together so Kathy this there was a lot I know you mentioned just, there's a lot to talk about what we can't talk about it all on our show today but where can people find more information like this we post uh, my business is a lot of information on my Facebook social media pages which are dependable dogs and kids and dogs safer together because it's also just updating newer research, little sure. videos. Familypaws.com, which is the Family Paws Parent Education okay. piece. It has a lot of little short webinars, tip sheets. Um, Jen also runs a warm line, which is an 877. If you know it's 2 a.m., something's happened, and you need someone to talk to pretty quickly, oh. they'll, she'll connect you with an educator or call you back herself. Um, okay. There's a lot of really just much better info out there. It's just sure. a, a way of how to find it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like uh, as always, social yeah. media and websites, perfect. Well, Kathy, we're out of time, but I want to thank oh, you so much. Thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. And if you have an idea for Dana and I on a parenting topic or show or guest, talk to us on Twitter at or Facebook at CTN Ann Arbor. For more on programming and services available at CTN, visit a2gov.org slash watch CTN. Thanks for joining us on this adventure in parenthood. Bye-bye.